So one thing that we've been talking about is the idea that the prognosis that is, that is given by most manual therapists is somewhat unrealistic. If you have a degenerated patellar tendon, so the patellar tendon has literal degeneration, to tell someone that I can treat that patellar tendinopathy within two or three visits is completely um, a fabrication. You can't take a degenerated tendon and somehow speed up the healing process in such a way that it's all automatically going to heal. Similarly, like I said, if you have a plantar fasci fasciopathy or heel foot pain or plantar fasciitis, if you tell me that you've treated the plantar fasciitis once and the person was better, infinitely better, the, page, the thing went away, that's also not realistic because if you're claiming to have diagnosed a plantar fasciitis, you're claiming a very specific histological process that's occurred in that tissue that would take time in order to reverse, similar to a tendinopathy, similar to various other things, muscle tears, etc. So I tell people if you've treated a, patel a plantar fasciitis with one treatment and you fixed it, your diagnosis was wrong because obviously, or a patellar tendinopathy, you have a degenerated tendon you fixed with one visit, obviously your diagnosis was incorrect because you could not have magically sped up the, the cellular healing process. Okay? So when I'm talking about FR release and the way I look at it, I take a much longer prognosis, a much more realistic prognosis. And the prognosis just doesn't start and stop with someone's injury. You've got to think long term, how, is your, how are your inputs, be it manual therapy inputs or training inputs, how are those inputs altering in a beneficial way the turnover of tissue? And what do I mean by the turnover of tissue? If you take a photo of yourself three years or today, and three years from now, you look at that photo. We all have to understand that there is not a single cell in your body three years from now that existed in that photo. Your body completely turns over every cell in its body, in your, in your body. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So there's always turnover. Okay? Now, how does the tissue know how to lay down new tissue? What direction does it use? When it's turning over, so you have collagen, the collagen gets eaten up, more collagen gets produced, and this turnover keeps happening. So tissue keeps getting, plastic cells come in, break down tissue, plastic cells come in, reform tissue. How does the cellular components of connective tissue know in what direction to regenerate tissue? When this cellular turnover is going on, we have to have some kind of signal to the tissue so it knows how to reform, okay? Now, when you take someone who sits in a chair for their whole life, okay? They, let's say they're office worker. They sit with their knee at 90 degrees and they never explore the range past 90 degrees because why would you? You sit in the chair, you get up, you walk home, you, or you go to your car, you sit in your car chair, your, your leg is at less than it's at even more extended range, you go home, you sit at your dinner table, you eat dinner, you go to bed, your leg is extended. So very rarely do they go into this range past 90 degrees. So the question is, when your cells are turning over, the tissue that allows you to get past 90 degrees, if you never actually use that range of motion, when your cells turn over, it'll do so in a way that it will not give you that range. Does that make sense to everybody? So if there's a range of motion, so I'll give you this, 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 I'll put it this way. Who here has children, babies? When your babies were born, I'm assuming every one of your babies could do the splits. If you grabbed their legs and went like this, they were able to do the splits. Now, if you took the baby, and as the baby became a toddler and child and whatever, if you always kept putting them into that split position, when they're 40 years old, if they did it all the way along, they would be able to do the splits very easily. You're born with a great amount of movement. What happens though is your body determines what movements are necessary and then it eliminates all of the rest. And how does it do that? It doesn't make a conscious decision. The way it does it is as tissue turns over, it's going to turn over based on the demands placed on it. So when you place a demand on a tissue, Whatever the tissue is, the tissue will adapt to the demand you put on it. 
So if your demand is, if you can do the splits, and you continue to do the splits, the demand is there. The way the tissues turn over will be in such a way that it will allow you to continue to do the splits. But if you don't use a range of motion, let's say the person who's the office worker never bends their knee, if you never give that stimulus to the fibroblasts, the fibroblasts will never adapt to that stimulus. And therefore, when you go to try to bend your knee past 90, you can't do it. That's why North America, where we sit in chairs all the time, a lot of people cannot go into a full squat. Versus if you go somewhere, India, uh, the Orient, you'll see elderly people able to sit into a full squat. That's not because of the location of where they live, it's because of the demands they place on their tissues. Okay? So when you're thinking about an athlete, and when you're taking an athlete across the career, you have to keep these ideas in mind. If you want them to be able to move a certain way, first of all, you have to progressively load the tissues in order to allow the body to adapt to your stimulus so that they can achieve a particular range of motion. And then you have to constantly explore, utilize those ranges of motion with your training in order that when your cells turn over, they do so in a way that allows that range of motion or movement to continue. Does that make sense to everybody? So, a good example, I recently had a patient that came in with low back pain. Okay, they had a, a history, they had a history, I forgot how many years ago, they had a very serious low back pain problem. So what did the therapist do? The therapist told them to maintain neutral spine all the time. They wanted them to sit with neutral spine, they wanted them to move around with neutral spine, train with neutral spine, never get out of neutral spine. Because they most likely read somewhere that neutral spine is the safest way for your spine to be. Okay? Now, over, I don't know how many years of this person maintaining neutral spine. Now, this person was a very special case because he took it so literally that when he walked into my office, I saw him walk into the office, and the way he sat was like this. He maintained neutral spine all the time. If I asked him to pick up a pen, he picked it up like this. He actually learned from another therapist to hinge at the hips. And he actually was given exercises teaching him to only hinge at the hips. So hinge at the hips and keep the back in neutral spine over a prolonged period of time. Now he comes to me and I go to assess his spine. And what I asked him to do was a simple cat camel maneuver. So go on your hands and knees. I want to see how much you can push your, your spine up, how much you can extend your spine down. Guess how much motion he had? Absolutely zero motion. So his spine, you can think of it, it was completely fused. There was no intersegmental play at all. Now, how do you explain that? You explain that because as the body turned over, because he never explored any motions, he never utilized his back in a segmental way, he only hinged at his hips, of course, when the tissues turn over, they're going to turn over in such a way that it's going to solidify you in the position that you ask for. If you always maintain neutral spine, you will always be in neutral spine. You're communicating with your tissues, even though you don't know that. Every time you move, you're communicating with your tissues. Okay? That's why I always recommend people, when they first get up in the morning, it's a great idea to go through and explore all of your ranges. So do some rotational exercises with your shoulder, with your neck, with your hips, with your back, with your knees, with your ankles. Because if you're one of those people whose job maintains you in a particular position, and you do that for years and years and years, when you try to use your body in a way outside of that range of motion, the range of motion will not be available to you. You might discover this by trying the range of motion and saying, oh darn, I can't get into it. Or you might discover this by joining a local men's baseball league and just going right into it and pretending that you were the same person you were in that picture three or 10 or 20 years ago. Then you start to play the game and you realize that when you go into one of these ranges of motion that your body no longer allows, you get an injury. Okay, so the moral I think of this story is 
think about the development of your athletes over a longer period of time. How are you influencing the way that their cells turn over? And that's a very, very important concept to keep in mind, not only for you know, treatment or for rehabilitation, but for daily exercise, for how you maintain your body. You have to maintain ranges to keep ranges. If you don't use ranges, your body just gets rid of them. Your body's very efficient. Your body will expend energy to keep ranges alive or available if you use them. But if you don't, why waste the, why waste the, the energy keeping muscular tissue that would be necessary for that movement? Just scar that stuff over. Let's add some dead tissue that doesn't require energy. That's the way your body works. It's very, very efficient. Does anybody have any, any questions?